What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? So, unless you've been living under a rock or perhaps on the moon, and now, not even then, you can't have failed to have noticed that the greatest science-themed film extravaganza of our times is nigh. I speak, of course, of Moonfall. And uh, we're going to break down the second trailer. So, they seem to have spent a hell of a lot of money on a stellar cast. Donald Sutherland's in there now, we know. Halle Berry but they don't seem to have put much into science advice. So we're going to break down this trailer in a somber, sober and astronomical manner. And I'm sure, Paul, after you finished on the decadal survey, there must have been some chat about Moonfall, surely. Yeah, actually, I, I think one of our um, recommendations might be to try and, and make sure that we have to go see this film. <laughs> so we understand what uh, we're up against. And you, you talk about how um, we're going to break down the trailer. We may break down in an effort uh, to break the trailer down because it looks absolutely it looks the movie's gotten stupider since the first trailer so uh, my interest in seeing it has proportionally gone up it looks it looks what i call awful amazing if that yeah. does that does that resonate with you yeah absolutely i mean and, and if you look at the kind of the progression of movies you had the day after tomorrow in 2004 are we 2012 confusingly in 2009 here we are in <laughs> 2021 2022 with moonfall uh, I, I don't. I don't know uh, if these guys are going to peak, but certainly I think we're. You know, each of these movies is building on the other in terms of the sheer amount of absurdity involved. I uh, I couldn't agree more. So so just to let you guys know, Paul is an associate professor of Earth and Planetary Science at Washington University in St. Louis, where he proclaims to study all planets except the boring ones. Paul, remind us which one is the boring one. Mars. That's right. Exactly Straight right. Straight down. And, and if you hear otherwise, it's big Mars trying to convince you. <laughs> it's very topical. So you can find Paul on Twitter at The Planetary Guy, where he's always posting interesting astronomical studies, ideas, pictures, facts, and explaining why indeed he does hate Mars. Um, so, Paul, before we dive in, I want to recheck your credentials a little bit. So in part one, we talked about our favorite awful slash amazing Disaster movies. You went with the core, um, yeah, and I down. kind of agreed with that. I'm going to need a second choice, and why it's amazing slash awful. I would go with Sunshine. I'll tell you. I'll tell you for why. One, Kappa's Jump is an amazing song that I do a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of work to. That is a great track. The physicist becomes the hero. They all turn to him for guidance. He becomes a hero. Even outdoes Captain America in one of his. First That's true, actually. Yeah. Yes, he does. Yeah, he uh, dies in the old uh, coolant there. Although he is being pretty heroic at the time, I guess. And they've also got this giant Parker Solar Probe style ship, which is, uh, you know, Parker's very uh, topical at the moment. I believe it's making its fastest approach very soon, isn't it? So that's right. Yeah, in, in, in less than a week, it's going to it's going to set the record for the fastest human made object ever, mm. as it makes its, I think, fourth flyby of the sun. So those are my those are my reasons for calling sunshine. How about yourself? And and to be fair, the hero is played by an Irish lad, so that's, I that's feel like awesome. it's an I still can't too. tell, and I you know I don't want to get into looks whether he's in, in, incredibly good looking or incredibly scary looking, sort of a. And my girlfriend is, says the is, same thing. I, I can't yeah. work it out. He's got yeah, like, no, Cillian Murphy is a, he's a he's a distinct looking guy. I think he's terrific. I've liked him in everything. Yeah, I've he's seen very him. good. I like him. Yeah, as he's well. very very good. Yeah, but but I mean, sometimes is actually I gotta say I actually think sometimes it's terrific. It kind of goes off the rails in the latter part when mm. it turns out that there's a guy. Yes. Okay, spoilers for a fourteen year old movie. <laughs> where it turns out there's a, there's like the captain of the Icarus One is somehow still alive seven years. Uh, you know, hasn't died of sepsis. Um, but but the concept, and I will I will say some of the things. One of the be best things that this movie does is it conveys the scale of the solar system. Mm. A huge number of films tend to skip over this. And, and you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, like the worst defenders because they just you can appear get within, somewhere else. Yeah, anywhere. Like yeah. it's essentially an instantaneous teleportation. Whereas in this movie, you get a sense of how big the solar system is. And I like that. There aren't very many that do that. There's a few, but there aren't very many. Um, uh, so in terms of best, worst movies that I uh, can't use the core, um, Okay, well, so there's two big asteroid movies, and I yes. like them for different reasons. There's Deep Impact, which, yeah. relatively speaking, is the more cerebral of the two. Yeah, that's true. And right, when they go to a comet, and then there's uh, Armageddon. They both come out in 1998. Um, Armageddon, <laughs> that is where they go to an asteroid. 
And Armageddon, there's a scene where there's a machine gun on. Oh, yeah. Like, yes. Armageddon is, is the less cerebral of the two. But they're both guilty pleasures. So I'm going to go with those two. I, I think those are, those are very good uh, very good choices. Elijah Wood in before his uh, Lord of the Rings fame, I think, as well. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and, and you had Morgan Freeman as the president. That's um, right. Yeah. Uh, who else? Tia Leone was in it. Yeah. You've got a, got a bunch of famous people. Um, yeah, Robert Duvall. It's actually not a bad movie, directed by Mimi Leader. Um, and there was this very cool sequence where the asteroid strikes the Atlantic and there's this you know, crazy yeah. mega tsunami that wipes out New York. And just visually, I, it was interesting because back in the late 90s, when computer generated effects were becoming more and more capable, I mean, they look dated now, but they were becoming more and more popular. Mm. The trailers to those movies would usually have one big kind of centerpiece visual effect. Yeah. And that was the bit that you saw teased. And now, because movies are 80% CG, <laughs> there's no there's no such kind of big event anymore. But certainly with Deep Impact, the sequence for that smaller of the two comic chunks hits Earth. I seem uh, to remember was, like the, there's a big wave like pushing on a skyscraper or something. Yeah, it knocks one building into another. Yeah. I don't think that would happen. But yeah, I mean, you know, it looked great. Now that said, you know, we, we're not going to deconstruct that movie today. The wave hits off North Carolina, which means the wave will be coming into New York from the south east. Yeah. But in the movie, it comes in from the southwest yeah. because of the way it hits. Who cares? No yeah. one's yeah yeah. That. We sort of when we're, when we're breaking this down, we sort of care not care, don't we? we we're gonna we're gonna take it on its own terms and enjoy it, but we're gonna we're gonna look at the science as well and see how. Uh, just how crappy it is. And then when we go watch yeah. it, we're just going to ignore all of that. So, uh, yeah, you know. trying to suspend our disbelief. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Exactly right. So let's uh, let's jump into this. So can you see the uh, the old? Um... Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to maximize that. And I've got a couple of waypoints where I want to stop. So we'll play like the first 30 seconds. And then uh, if you can give some thoughts, that'd be great. Can you hear that? Yep. That's Falcon 9 going off there. Yeah. July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In school, you were taught that Apollo 11 lost contact with the world for two minutes. Not true. Now. So, not true, apparently. <laughs> Any initial thoughts, Paul, before I give some of mine? Yeah, why would there be a light on that thing you drop off? Other than making it look cool to see that red thing going down that tunnel. Like, we don't put lights on spacecraft normally unless there's a particular need to. It's so. like some sort of scanning probe or something like the one in Yeah, there. yeah. I mean, we tend not to scan with red lights, but maybe. Okay. All right, we'll go, we'll, we'll go with that. So, for my cool. first thought here... Pretty good cast. 85-year-old Donald Sutherland here. Halle good Berry. Good to see him getting work, yep. They've got the, the lad out of, I forget his name, out of, uh, um, the, oh, what's the, uh, Game of Thrones. So there's there's some some really decent actors in this. They're not they're not messing around. Mm -hmm. Roland Emmerich as the, no. uh, as the uh, director. Um, really uh, pretty stellar cast, to be honest. And, and uh, each line delivered with gravitas, which <laughs> can go some way to make it more credible. If it's said in a serious way, it, it seems less absurd. That's true. And every movie has to have this sort of kookish old man, like the guy in you, you, It's uh, like in it, contact it anchors who... the story. It's, it, exactly. It's the Haddon in contact. Uh, it's, it's um, I'm trying to think, who's the old, there's a, is, is it Donald Sutherland? In Ad Astra? Yes. Might actually be Donald Sutherland. <laughs> Um, yeah, you always got to have some of the old wise guy who's going to, and I, without knowing really anything beyond what the trailer shows, my guess is that his role is maybe he was involved in Apollo or something and yeah, he's yeah. finally blowing the whistle on whatever yeah, deep dark secret. So, so this is a really interesting angle actually, given sort of the current state of the world, is that mm. I've got to say at this point that I do love a good conspiracy theory movie, although maybe <laughs> it's a little bit on the nose at the current time, but Emmerich actually admits, so I've looked at a couple of the sort of interviews for this film, and he admits that he drew on a ton of kind of moon conspiracy theories to make the movie. Now, the idea behind that is obviously people have some sort of intrinsic interest. There's a familiarity yeah. with some of these ideas. You've heard some of the crazy old wives tales or urban myths. So there's already people 
saying, oh, I kind of heard of that. I'll go see the movie. And obviously it brings yeah. its own kind of element of crazy. Now, whether that'll hold up still really well, I don't know. Because I'm thinking about, I was thinking about the new, I recently and only very recently watched the new X-Files ones. Like the very new ones, the ones they did like 10 years after the old. And I was like, these are horrible. And I think yeah, there's a couple they, of they couple of ideas. Well. One, they were a bit sort of tired and the acting wasn't great and it seemed like a bit of a cash grab. But the other one kind of, the other element seemed to be people were like, oh, shit, we're kind of dealing with a lot of conspiracy theories and, yeah. you know, misinformation and stuff at the moment. And, and X-Files didn't hit the same as it did maybe before the internet and social media became such a big thing. So I don't know if that's yeah. going to be, I don't know if that's going to play in this film's favour. Maybe it still will because people still love conspiracy theories. I mean, I, I guess it depends on how, how absurd they go. Cause, cause you're right. The, you know, the X-Files kind of brought to the fore, like kind of like an underground view of people on Telnet sharing ideas with each other. I mean, there've always been conspiracy theorists. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a, a classic example from the mid 20th century is JFK's assassination. Yeah. It didn't need the internet to get those ideas going. Yeah, and there are true. hundreds more. Um, but you're right. I think when you start to get to the point where there's so much issue with misinformation today. But the thing, too, is that much of the misinformation today revolves around fairly mundane things, whether yeah. or not a vaccine works, yeah. as opposed to something like, oh, we didn't land on the moon. Yeah. And one thing, I, I do not engage people online who want to debate the whole <laughs> moon landing thing. I just don't. Life's too short for me. <laughs> Waste my time with that. But but the fact it's is... It's kind that, of more harmless, though, isn't it? Because it's... You know, well, so here, but see, here's the thing. I see this as kind of the gateway into something that becomes not harmless. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, Pizzagate. Like, a couple of well, a few years ago, a guy turns up to a pizza joint in in Northwest DC, which happened to be a block from where I once lived, with a machine gun, basically, well, an assault rifle, trying to uh, free children he thought were in some sort of international pedophile ring. Completely insane stuff mm -hmm. because he got it online. So my worry is that by sort of making light of these kinds of you know, easy things like the moon stuff, because that doesn't hurt anybody really, right? Um, is that it could be a gateway. So I'm curious to know how that narrative is managed and how this movie is marketed. Yeah. Um, because it may be the idea that conspiracy theory of the moon is something in the moon is so absurd yeah. that people can definitely see it for what it is. But if there's some sort of like narrative here about <laughs> all the powers that be hiding this and now people have to delve down, that's not it, a good it's, message. It's, it's the moon that they don't want you to know about. Kind of yeah, thing. like that's not a good message to, to be kind of sending in this day and age. So I'm curious to know how that narrative is taken in the movie well, we'll have to see so i'm sure you know about about a few of these so that the claim is basically that the astronauts who went out on apollo 11 um they saw landed alien craft and things like this basically just parked chilling there on the moon and uh, the reason we don't know about this is because the communications for apollo 11 were cut off for two minutes Essentially, two minutes of silence just after they landed in 1969. And the idea is they didn't want to get this information about the uh, the parked alien spacecraft out there. So they had these secret medical channels that they could communicate back to Earth, all of this information, which it seems very, um, very coordinated um, to be able to have done that. And, and the evidence for this is, as you might imagine, pretty... Uh, pretty thin on the ground Tenuous. yeah, yeah um, exactly. it's usually just that neil armstrong's body language is a bit subdued when he returned when he should have been jumping up and down and apparently this proves that he saw aliens and is now terrified i mean anytime i see someone who looks a little subdued my first thought my only thought is aliens that they've seen aliens and they're lying to me they haven't. i just um, imagine he was it, pissed it, off with being asked questions for like <laughs> the same inane question for the last yeah I, uh, I mean, you know, I, I was never fortunate enough to meet uh, Neil Armstrong, uh, but I know people who, who worked with him. And, and by all accounts, this guy was a fairly unassuming mm. private man mm. who did who went out of his way to avoid publicity, uh, was not by his own admission a spokesperson for the world. Mm. Um, I, 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 that's what I read into uh, his body language. Whereas in contrast, Buzz Aldrin has been an amazing steward of of human exploration the solar system he's famous for wearing t-shirts to say get your ass to mars um i, remember, you know, I seem Aldrin to remember him lamping someone who uh came so over the, and yeah, said well, that he like hadn't landed guys, on the moon 
Yeah, now I think in the end that guy had been hassling for a while, but there is video on YouTube. I mean, it wasn't that he just came up and whacked him, but I think that guy had been hassling for like repeatedly. But like, basically, he was yeah. like, "Yeah, he just punched him." Um, yeah, basically, you know, so it's not just Apollo Eleven, right? And um, we've had astronauts. Uh, there were five subsequent landings, ten other people, including Neil and Buzz. Yeah, that's in true. addition to Neil and Buzz, um, we've had high resolution telescopes in orbit of the moon for a while, like yeah. since 2009. It's true that we can't see the landing sites on the moon with Hubble because even though Hubble can see extremely great distances, like you know, most of the way back to the beginning of time as it matters <laughs> to us, um, but it's, it's imaging absolutely galactic scale objects. So it cannot resolve very small scale objects on the moon. Its resolution from Earth orbit to the moon is about 100 meters per pixel, so it cannot see the lunar landing sites. But we have photographed the lunar landing sites from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. We've had other countries that have gone to the moon before and since. We've had a lot of, yeah. the Russians never sent astronauts there, but we've had um, many other Russian missions there. Uh, the Chinese have successfully landed yeah. several yeah. landers and now have a rover there. Um, they've even done a sample return mission. So where are the alien ships and how come no one else has talked about it and how come the only compelling bit of evidence is two minute blackout supposedly in an era when <laughs> we were still using valve computers um to land people on the moon uh, so mm, i was gonna say know, if I, it had only been a two minute blackout for the whole mission i'd be like that was pretty good in 1969 to be fair well, uh, uh, to be fair yeah like i mean i'm it, it, i'm kind of surprised that something didn't you know didn't happen that was worse although bear in mind they had some you know, there were close calls throughout those missions by virtue of just how unbelievably risky what it was, what they were doing was, including the fact that when they landed, they had about something like 20 seconds of fuel left uh, before they would have had to abort. I mean, the landing itself, see, this is one of the reasons that pisses me off with these things too, is because if, you know, notwithstanding the whole thing, well, we didn't land on the moon for reasons that I don't understand physics, but I'm therefore going to just pontificate about it anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of attitude. Um, it just undermines a humongous human yeah. achievement that we had. Um, but it also doesn't hold to any kind of scrutiny because my, I think the most compelling reason, well, that's a lie, let me start over. I know they landed on the moon for a variety of reasons, including having spoken to people who've walked on the moon, and I've seen the space hardware that's come back, and I've seen the rocks we've brought back, and I've seen them in, when we cut them in half, and we can see stuff in the minerals that we do not see on Earth. Yeah. So th there is not a shadow of a doubt. But what I find a compelling reason for conspiracy theorists to mull on, uh, because they, they, again, stepping back from all of this moon stuff, if you're talking with a conspiracy theorist, they are not open-minded people who just are confused. And if you show them the right bit of evidence and help them get to themselves, they'll change their mind. The, the goalposts consistently shift because the point isn't to figure it out. The point is to continue to, to be an yeah, ordinary to protect, to protect the narrative. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? And so basically, there is no one single argument or any dozen that's going to change a conspiracy theorist's mind unless they generally have a cop on about themselves, generally. Um, but I will say this. If the Americans faked the moon landings for some reason, then why didn't the Russians go on about it? Because the Russians would have had the ability, they did, track every object that went to the moon. So if that Saturn V took, I mean, I don't think anyone ever doubted the Saturn V, so you don't fake that. But, oh, well, maybe they separated an orbit, they came back down somewhere, and they went to a sound stage. Okay, um, how come the Russians never called it out? The Russians have absolutely imminently yeah. been able to go track stuff that went to the moon. And if they didn't go to the moon in orbit, do you think the Russians would say quiet of the Soviet Union? <laughs> quiet about this? So even you using know. a conspiratorial angle, you still can't sort of justify this? Uh... There just nothing about it makes sense. And and the things that people think are like the gotcha, or the flag looks like it's flow, blowing. Well, yeah, but it, it's not, though, because you video and it doesn't move. And it's made of metal and there's a support bar. And, oh, well, I can't see the stars. You can never see the stars if you want to change the exposure such that you can actually make sense of what you're seeing on the surface, particularly in shadowed areas. Oh, well, the lighting is wrong, except it's not. There's one light source. It's just... I, go, I know, I know it, it, because you see it with COVID or climate or whatever. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just throw a load of stuff at you, make you work through it. And then when yes. you get to the end of it, it's like, There's well, more I still don't believe developed. you. So it was pointless you doing yeah. that. It's like, yeah, better yeah, yeah, just exactly. not to engage with. Exactly. And it is also worth also bearing in mind, and I try to remind myself of this so I keep my sanity. The majority, the overwhelming majority of people are normal and well-adjusted yeah. and they understand that this is nonsense. It's the people who don't tend to be quite vocal, even though they are absolutely minority um so let, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we are talking about the fringe of the fringe here yeah. in terms of conspiracy theorists the, the problem is uh, or, or the, the well the people who are making good money out of this are, are all kind of of a similar ilk so you've got david childress on the right here he's from ancient aliens he's got 
the, the the author of the brilliant Yeti, Sasquatch, and Hairy Giants. Uh, no comments on Paul's beard, please. Um, <laughs> and people like Michael Sala, who looks a little bit crazy. I, I really enjoyed this book, the U.S. Navy's secret space program and the Nordic Estra Extraterrestrial Alliance with some sort of weirdly Aryan Nordic looking woman hanging around. Yeah, and I've got to say, that captain looks, has a striking resemblance to Robert Picardo who played the Doctor in Voyager. <laughs> he does, I just I don't sure know that who that is. He does look like Robert Picardo, you're just right. Makes it even weirder. He's in Stargate as well. He plays um, he yes. plays one of the characters in Stargate. Um, He's a yes. German student as well, anyway. Yes, he is. So, uh, so yeah, some very uh, interesting characters. There's definitely money to be made, shall we say, from uh, from peddling bullshit. Uh, let's let's. Yeah, and, and again, like you know, if this stuff doesn't harm anyone, I don't really care. My worry is that people will start thinking that like this is real, and then then you start getting into trouble. Because the thing is. A lot of people are not equipped because of schooling around the world to develop their critical thinking skills. And so there are people who become quite um, vulnerable to these kinds of ideas because developing your critical thinking skills takes work and practice. And if you are not exposed to it or you don't see a need to, it can be quite hard. It can be quite hard to sort of, who do you trust? And that's why people who have large platforms have a moral responsibility, in my opinion, to convey correct, accurate information, correct inaccuracies and misconceptions. And people who write these things, unless they are very clear up front, uh, are, are, are not, they're, they're failing to meet up to that responsibility. A good example is a few years ago, I think it's the Discovery Channel over here that does Shark Week. Yeah. And they had a program, Megalodon, which of course is <laughs> terrifically fascinating monster shark, right? Yeah. That was historical. And by all accounts, Megalodon went extinct no more recently than two million years ago. Um, but uh, there is incorrect stuff in, 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 in old literature from the 1800s that they found, the Challenger found teeth that suggest that they, were, they weren't fossilized, they were real, suggesting that they found neck teeth somehow. Um, and of course, that's led to all sorts of, I mean, we've had movies, there are books, there are all kinds of shows about it. But Discovery Channel put together this, this, this basically a, like a fake documentary about, um, you know, where they photoshopped in a giant fit into these old, the old timey photographs and stuff. But at the end of the episode, the end of this one-off show, it's like the previous show was uh, fictitious, <laughs> but like it doesn't lead with that. So yeah. if you don't know how to critically assess information you're presented with, for example, on TV, uh, you might sit through that whole thing and through no fault of your own, have no idea this is a joke. Well, Ancient and Aliens is on, the, is on the History Channel, right? Which is a little So bit... Ancient Aliens, is, is my view, is much worse because not only does it do this sort of, you know, ab complete abdication of moral responsibility, but Ancient Aliens is also deeply, deeply racist because the whole thing is predicated upon the fact that a old peoples on Earth from a few hundred or thousand years ago couldn't possibly have done whatever <laughs> they did. And therefore, we're going to invoke something for which there's no evidence when the alternative is that simply people from what we might now consider less developed countries somehow were extremely creative architects and artists and stuff. Uh, so there's a huge colonial racist undertone on these things too, which pissed me right off. So yeah, again, again, if you want to believe the moon has is hollow and there's a monster in it, I'm like, that doesn't really harm anybody if you can see it for what it is. But a lot of other conspiracy stuff is, just, is, is meaningfully bad. Like, you know, objectively bad because it, it, it's designed to harm or otherwise just disenfranchise or disadvantage people, and, and I, I really don't like that. Yeah, fair enough. So let's uh, let's uh, let's whiz on a little bit a little bit more in this to fifty four. So can I just also point out? Yes. Why in these movies is the reception always really bad? But the, the way people who make trailers now will transition from one scene to this, it's all static. The crackling radio, it, yeah. Yeah, but like that's not what digital streams look like when they get all disturbed. And like that's what like unless you're watching this trailer with you know aerials on your telly, again, I just it's just a thing. It's like a record scratch to indicate something has changed. It's yeah, like yeah. let's get new ways of conveying these things. I think it's just the old transitions, isn't it? People have got used to that as a transition between different frames, and they it's exactly it's a just, preset on their. Premiere Pro. And it, yeah, yeah. It's a plug throw for throw sure. that it's in. Something's changed. Yeah. It's a plug-in and After Effects. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. So let's uh, let's play this to what have I got to fifty four? Right, so this looks like we got the space shuttle here. Yeah. Working on a satellite sometime. They found something on that day that they kept hidden for fifty years, and now it's too late to stop. So. Any thoughts on this bit before I give uh, 
my dear. What the hell is happening? All right, so so okay, we've got, <laughs> now we have shuttle. we have got some answers. So in trailer one, we were talking yes. about the problem that like regolith and rock shouldn't be flying off the earth because the moon has come closer. They would still be connected to the earth. But it looks mm -hmm. like actually it's some sort of effect or influence right. if from something this is, is... giant beast that's doing it. Right. So, you know, OK, I, I will stand back and say, you know, full disclosure, as a planetary scientist, if you if someone invokes giant beast, I have to stand back and say, OK. <laughs> right. So whatever phenomenon we're going to see, you know, I'm not equipped to assess yeah. what giant space beast will do. I'd yeah. like to learn, but I don't know. Yes. I, my, my, my I'm, I'm open work. to the fact that it can break the laws of physics in some way. We'll, uh... you, you know, fine. OK. Yeah. I mean, as long as I understand what's happening in these rocks. And uh, my first question, though, is like, I'm trying to work out when this movie is set, because what is the space shuttle doing up there? Yes. And clearly the shuttle is caught up in this. Right. So so if this is set in the modern era or maybe a few years of because you know, this the last shuttle flight was 2011. Yeah. Now, maybe they've you know, they, they took one out of storage. There are shuttles that are in storage, mm -hmm. but I would imagine it'd be cheaper to build a new one than somehow refurbish yeah. those ones and fly them again. So first off, my question is, what the hell is the shuttle doing here? But OK. So it looks like they've sort of. They had this thing, it was covered up for 50 years, and it, well, because it said 50 years, right? So 69, that will get us to 2019. So it could be that we're in 2019. So okay. it sounds okay. like they've either brought the one out or they've okay. made some new ones, and now they're going back to the moon, and they were, it looked like they were putting a satellite there or some sort of communication yeah. system. Yeah, and bearing in mind, of course, that the shuttle operated at an altitude of, let's say, between, I don't know, 300 and 600 kilometers, let's say. Uh, moon is 384,000 kilometers. Minor point, but okay. Okay. I suppose if to be fair, if the moon is coming to Earth, maybe then suddenly the orbital altitude becomes less important. Maybe. Maybe this is just. We'll say this is shuttle V2. So this is uh, yeah, okay. some sort of V2 <laughs> shuttle. I I always find it interesting in these films that the baddie, it, and it's become more and more in in modern films that it's just some sort of disembodied black sludge slash nanoparticle thing seems to be like... I think we've seen this before. Exactly. So sure. X-Files, yeah. you've got black sludge. you got the, the black new Terminators yeah. are all these little nano yes, particles, yeah, yeah. sludge. Uh, you've got, there, there's the nano cloud in the remake of The Day of the Earth, still, still 2008 with Keanu Reeves, not a good movie. Um, <laughs> there's... It, it, it's some God love me. I have seen most of the Michael Bay Transformer movies, not all of them, thankfully. Oh my um, God, I saw. There's oh, something, Christ yeah, the but there's something in, that does this too. Uh, you know that those movies were far from the kind of blocky things we would have had as kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I feel we've seen weirdly articulating, and of course, there's the black smoke thing in Lost. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe they're all related. Maybe this is like a bigger version of the True. Rest of it. I don't so know. It's, maybe it's we're bringing all of the films together. It does seem like he's taking sort of tropes from a lot of other films and bringing them together here. Obviously, uh, black because evil, and uh, for some yeah, reason, why isn't it pink? Yeah, it couldn't be pink. There we go. And for some reason, cool. it makes it makes like a a humanized face because obviously you would make your ravenous nanoparticle cloud show a face or something to i guess to transmit yeah, you know, you know, the agency of it to the to the audience yeah but like how does it know that it, like what, what face to make like i mean we are not the volumetrically or numerically the most common thing on the planet why doesn't it make an insect face or a fish face is it more fish in the sea than the humans on land? i would like it to be bright pink and make a fish face that would be uh or like because one of those I honestly faces think people it's... making photographs before yeah, swallowing the time whole. By the time that happens in the movie, I'm assuming the audience is just willing to accept anything, so it probably wouldn't even stop. <laughs> Fair enough. Right, let's whiz on a tiny, a tiny bit more. So I got to 111. In breaking news, the governor has cool just shot. ordered the mass evacuation of the cool entire shot. West Coast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the only possible chance of surviving. Uh, both Stay away, my brothers and sisters! Stay away! So we've got we've got the influencers. The podcasters are still doing well. Yeah, Presumably, well, this, this like, is some sort of religious zealot who's worshiping the moon guy gods. who's here. He, he reminds me of um, uh, Ben Kingsley's character in Iron Man Three. Yes. Derek. <laughs> he's got that kind of thing going. He does. So yeah, I mean, I guess I don't know. He's probably pushing for the truth, which is uh, honestly, if the if the real world in this movie is that there's some sort of space monster. Then I'm assuming the conspiracy theory truth is even stupider still. So I'm I'm curious to know what he's. I pushing. do it. I do enjoy the little uh, what the bar on the bottom. See if I can find the bit that I uh, 
particularly like it's scientists warn of something if i can get it in scientists are always warned they warn of moonfall where is it? yes here we go scientists warn of moonfall side effects we dive deeper at 11 it's clearly not the biggest story of the day yeah, the, the biggest the story is what, markets or markets shifting yeah, or maybe the, the shifting tides <laughs> I have many questions. Yeah, more at 11. That's, that's terrific. <laughs> but, but at the same time, to be fair, you know that someone made that Chiron really fast. Because these movies have generally sh fairly short production times, yeah. right? So, you know, someone was like, you have to go make a Chiron for that scene. Okay, and two minutes of thought went into it. Um, so fair play that it looks like it's spelled correctly. Because again, I, that cannot have been very high up in the list of things to do to finish the movie in time for its release. Yeah. So, And it looks like uh, if we play it on a tiny bit further... Stay away. It looks like the sort of effects we talked about in the first film are starting to happen. Right, so, so now we've got some... So, okay, so this building looks awfully like... I don't know that it is. It looks awfully like the vehicle assembly building, Yeah. which is where they were... Originally, it was built to stack the Saturn V rockets for the Apollo program, uh, and then was used for the shuttles, and now, right now, actually has the Artemis One flight vehicle in it. They've stacked SLS. Um... Now, what's curious is it doesn't quite look like the VAB, which is one of the largest enclosed volumes in the world, but it has that look. It's a big monolithic thing, huge American flag. But I'm also seeing mountains in the background, and the VAB is in the Florida coast. There are no mountains in Florida. The whole thing is flat and swampy. So I, so this isn't, I don't think, the VAB, um, but it has that kind of big space infrastructure look to it. And then, of course, there's this mad-looking wave that's going up but you know i'm at this point i'm prepared to accept we, we, so we talked about the sort of physics last time we're, we're happy with the big waves that would probably happen lots of wind would probably happen stuff flying off the surface no unless that this beast does does something so we're not yeah, the we're beast not going magic powers then yeah i'm prepared although prepared i did that. uh i did watch yesterday um Independence Day Resurgence. Don't don't watch it. I don't know if you've seen it. I I watched it on a plane, and it was that or trying to open the door. So I probably made the right call. It was it was so poor. Uh, it was not a good movie. No, it was not. It, a was good movie not at all, actually. it started off okay, but I, I felt like it was one of these films where they just got stuck trying to bring in loads of little callbacks to like previous people and stuff that it didn't know whether it wanted to be a new movie that was half decent or. Just a load yeah, of callbacks yeah. to the old film, so it just yeah, ended up that's being sort how of... I felt about it. And awesome. and like it's got this thing where the the humans now have all these amazing technology, and so the peril didn't really feel the same. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure why they made it but anyway. It felt like they were more on a par with the aliens, so it wasn't as mm. it wasn't as good. Um, but yeah, the point I was going to make yeah. about that is they have a weird scene where things just start flying off into space as well. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, and they they have a massive gravity effect, right? And then it ends up dropping the British Khalifa on London, yeah, that's or right. something like that's that. Right. Yeah, and, and the ship that Jeff lands Gogons. is like the whole size of the Earth or something. It's, yeah, it's yeah, 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 exactly. Which probably would have a greater mass than the Moon, and therefore would be more destructive. But I can't imagine a ship holding up too well to being subject to those forces either. So, <laughs> right, let's whiz on a little bit. But I would say kudos to them thinking big. Yes. This planet. So that was a bit actually that you had a little bit of trouble with, with stuff being ripped towards the moon, which apparently yes. we've now answered. It's uh, some sort of weird. Has suffered five extinctions. This is going to be the sixth. Now, old uh, fancy man again has come up with this idea that the moon is going to bring about the mm. uh, the sixth mass extinction so we've had sort of five in history so i guess the idea now is that let me uh did that pause yes it did the idea now is that the moon is kind of some sort of technology or sort of survey base where we're being watched and it's sort of keeping an eye on our development which is actually another conspiracy theory that actually people have come up with so the idea that this moon is an artificial satellite and it's sort of keeping an eye on our development. So a lot of people probably know the moon. A lot of people think the moon needs to be there for us to have evolved, developed. It, it, um, I can't remember what it exactly does for our orbit, but it's very important. Obviously, it has a, a great impact on the tides. Um, but a lot of people have suggested that it might be an armoured spaceship, which is there to sort of keep an eye on, on our development. Paul, any thoughts? No. 
<laughs> this is Christopher, no, not, Christopher it, Knight's it, idea that it was uh, yeah, something it, that was it created. Is, there is no evidence whatsoever for that. None. And not only is there no evidence for that, there's lots of evidence for like... I mean, it, it is true that we still don't know all the details of how the moon was formed. We've yeah. got a pretty good idea that very early in Earth's life, and I mean early, like in the first 10 million years or so of its life, although we're not quite sure when, something hit Earth and created this huge debris cloud and then basically everything kind of coalesced to, around Earth and ultimately formed the moon. Um, but there is no evidence that it is anything but a natural object, and there's chemical and physical evidence for that. And to be clear, no evidence at all for anything not being it. Um, I, I'm thinking, I'm that, wasn't there a recent uh, a recent study of some large chunk of the moon that had come off? I can't remember the name of the thing. I yeah, so a paper moon. came out like a week ago suggesting yeah. that actually Earth had these kind of quasi moons that basically kind of get temporarily kind of start to circle us or or are in in, sequ in, in phase with us basically as we go around the sun. Um, and it turns out anyway that that one possibility on the basis of how this thing looks through a telescope, we've not got any samples of it, suggests that it actually could be a chunk of the moon kicked off from a big impact. And the moon has had lots of big impacts in its life. So it, so although it's a cool finding, I don't think it's a surprising finding yeah. that some of the debris from a modestly recent impact, and my modestly recent in geological terms, that could be tens or hundreds of millions of years. Yeah. Um, but there, it's not only that there is no evidence that it's some sort of alien spaceship or a construction or some sort of artificial <laughs> structure, but there's abundant evidence that that is completely self-consistent what we know of our own world that says that it's a completely naturally occurring thing now a big issue like you said is does the moon play a role in the habitability of earth and sustaining it that's an unknown that's a, you know there are things that we don't we don't have all the answers yet but we're not looking in a part of the of reality where we have to invoke crazy ideas like the moon is somehow hollow or a spaceship <laughs> to fill in those knowledge gaps so uh, you know I'll leave it there. This, uh, it would be a bit of an overpowered pr protagonist because I'm looking at these mass extinctions. I ha haven't covered them much in the past uh, or I don't know much about them, but it seems there's a lot of different reasons why these things happen. Potential asteroid impacts, rapid cooling, increases in methane, all these kind of weird things, volcanic activity. So it seems like in this film, this moon has a lot of powers that it can... Uh, Bring onto the earth. Yeah, so. if it's going to do that. Now, I mean, it's also worth pointing out that there are people who seriously maintain that we are experiencing a sixth mass extinction now yeah. caused by human activity. Because one of the things that defines a mass extinction is you look at the rock record, which you go from bottom to top, right? Yeah. You go from yeah. older rocks to younger rocks. And we do this, we look at what's in those rocks in terms of fossils. And then we see what fossil, not the number and variety of life forms that changes when you go from one stratum to another often marked by some catastrophic event, you know, wildfires or asteroid impact or whatever. And the definition of a, of a mass extinction is that most of what was there before doesn't make yeah, it through yeah. to the next layer because it gets wiped out by climate change or other environmental changes, some of which are gradual, some of which are fast. But even a gradual climate change in the rock record can be seen as a thin line. Yeah. And so the people have argued that Earth that Earth is undergoing a sixth mass extinction now by things like deforestation and ocean acidification. And even if it's taking a few hundred years, that's nothing geologically. Yeah, on a geological so if you were to go for 100 million years and look in the rock record, you might find this profusion of life and then just you know, disappears instantaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of reasons you can destroy environments and cause massive loss, loss of life. We haven't yet had a moon monster attack us and kill us. But... <laughs> You know, it's always the first time, Paul. It's always, it's always the, first the first time. time. Yes. So, uh, yes, it, it seems like if this were some sort of hollow hollow moon um, research base, they have a very odd research schedule, which is to, you know, wipe out all of the bivalves and now wipe out the humans. So I uh, don't know what they're what they're about, but there we go. So that's the that's the idea of. Uh, the moon being some sort of technology. And that sort of goes forward to uh, the last bit I want to look at, which is, uh, let's uh, whiz on to the end of this trailer, so. Are we dead? No, we are just inside the moon. That might be the greatest sentence anyone's ever said. So it's not. It's not the greatest. It's sentence not. You're, you're not having said. it. You're not having that. <laughs> no, it's stupid. I mean, you could get inside <laughs> the moon. You you could dig down a few meters and build a habitat and live inside the moon. Live in a lab tube. You could absolutely live inside the moon. But I don't think 
we're going to be flying into the interior volume of the moon because it doesn't exist. The inside of the moon is rock and metal. There was um, a really cool little fact that you, you'll appreciate. I'm sure you know it already. Um, when I was looking at, um, it was a paper of someone trying to build a, a particle collider on the moon. And if you dig down more than, I think it was more than 50 centimetres below the surface of the moon, the temperature becomes flat, basically consistent. It won't change more than that below 50, 50 centimetres on the surface. So if you wanted a consistent temperature to put a pipe of a particle collider around, for example, you could dig a metre under the surface, some trench, yeah. cover it over, and you could have a nice consistent temperature for whatever experiment you were trying to run, which seems naively bizarre you've got this very very cold vacuum of space and then if you get 50 centimeters under the surface you can have this consistent temperature it just turns out that mashed up crushed impact damaged rock is a pretty good insulator mm. uh, it doesn't conduct heat all that well or it does so very slowly and that's absolutely true now i mean as you go deeper still like on the kilometer scale to the 100 kilometer scale it will start to warm up again because there is still yeah. not much but there's a little bit of radioactive heat there's a little bit of original formational accretional energy inside the moon. Um, but absolutely, yeah, people have long thought about the idea of using, you know, a cut and cover approach yep. to put in habitats yep. or to, you know, you pile up like a berm of a lunar regolith around a habitat you you build um, or even using lava tubes, which we suspect yep. strongly yep. Are, are preserved on the moon as places where you would be shielded from solar radiation because there's no atmosphere to shield you or no magnetic field to shield you from uh, solar particles. So there are places where you could go in the moon, including inside the moon. But I want to be very clear here. Inside the moon means a few feet down. Not it doesn't into mean into the, the hollow internal structure not where the hollow people moon, live. No. <laughs> At all. At all. Good to be good to be clear. So it looks like in this the sort of final part of this this film, they're gonna to have to fly up to the moon presumably to either challenge this alien beast or turn off whatever machinery um, it is. So this um, this idea of this kind of hollow moon, there's a lot of people who've kind of covered this. Um, it was sort of brought up by H.G. Wells, the first men in the moon, and he envisaged that there'd be these sort of huge alien type bloated brain creatures that lived inside the moon. So... This has been around for sort of 120 more years that the idea that the moon is hollow. And I, I didn't know this. Um, and actually, the, the bit that sort of conspiracy theorists point to about this is this idea that the moon rang like a bell when when we landed probes on it. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about that? It's yeah, so basically... a misuse of a quote by Clive Neal. Yeah, exactly. And so basically what this turns out to be is it's to do with how rocks ring or or basically how you attenuate a, a sound when you pass sound waves through something. Mm -hmm. And so think of the difference between, say, um, uh, the, the way we would think of as, you know, bell or you know plucking a guitar string or you know, a violin string versus, you know, hitting like a concrete with a, with a hammer, you don't hear an echo, you don't hear a reverberation. Um, in the Apollo missions, when later missions, when folks are putting, basically they put individual seismic stations onto the moon to try and get a sense of what the interior is like, because that's how we do it for Earth, we listen to seismic signals. On Earth, we are given seismic energy by quakes, which happen all the time. There are lunar quakes, um, but one of the things that uh, NASA decided to do is they would take the, um, I think it was the S-4B, Basically, one of the upper stages of the Saturn V, which is smack which is injecting them to the moon. moon and smack it, you know, build up its trajectory such that it hits the moon. And because you know what its empty mass is and you know how fast it's going, because we can calculate that stuff, you know, therefore, what kind of kinetic energy you have in the impact. And then you listen and you know when the impact's happening. And then with your seismic stations, you listen to that. You know exactly where it's going to be and when it's going to be, how much energy it's going to be. So then looking at how much energy you get at your receiver station, you can work out how much energy made it through all the way to you and how much is absorbed by the moon and what they found was the seismic energy from those impacts went through the moon for longer than they expected it, it, it took longer to attenuate those signals yeah. not because the moon is inside or like a bell and that is unfortunately a, a phrase taken out of context yeah. simply because the lunar crust is so fractured from billions of years of impact by barbara and in that picture those circular round splotches i mean this is conversation for another day yeah. but those circles are impact basins some of them are absolutely you can fit europe inside them right yeah. they're huge yeah. so 
the reason that ringing like a bell happened is because this sonic or seismic energy was just able to pass through more of the moon for longer mm -hmm. Because the rock was much less able to just absorb that sound. It would be much more able to if it were intact. But the rock on the moon, we know from a variety of methods, is very, very heavily fractured to substantial depth, to tens of kilometers depth. That's why, in fact, we've actually learned recently that uh, much of the Martian crust is similar because now we can listen to quakes on Mars. We have NASA's InSight mission. And Mars doesn't quite ring like a bell, but we definitely get a much longer decay or coda if you listen to the waveform... It just means it's only hollow out. right at the middle, Paul. That's all that means. Oh, <laughs> I, I mean, to be clear, like, despite all this, I'm still going to go and see this stupid movie. But, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely curious to know just exactly how off the rails it goes. <laughs> they said, they mentioned in, in this piece as well, they were saying that um, the, the water on the Earth soaks up, so, acts kind of like a bit of a shock absorber for this. Yeah, it does. It does yeah. As well. So obviously yeah. you don't have that on the moon. So th it sounds like this was a bit of a, a misuse of a quote by, what was it, Clive R. Neal, Professor of Civil Engineering. Yeah, Clive Neal's at Notre yeah. Dame, yeah. And he yeah. does a lot of really, really great, great moon stuff. And of course, Clive is being accurate in how he describes it. But that's the onus then on yeah. people who write about this to say, you know, we're talking about how sound waves travel through and propagate through. Yeah. And how they are attenuated. Not that, it's not. Not, not that it's hollow inside like a bell. No, I, I mean, we. there are basic things beyond the scope of the time we've left to talk about. But there are ways we can work out what in, basically you know, planetary objects are made of and how their mass is distributed. There is in, even a particular kind of measure we can make that would tell us that it's hollow in the inside. And we have never found anything remotely like that anywhere. Nor would we expect to. Um, so... Yeah, so that's that's no not good. not an artificial object, not aliens. <laughs> it's never aliens. Right, I want to finish with a with a very final thing, Paul. So we'll 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 look at this, just run this to the end. One fifty two. So. So here's what they see when they get inside. What is your first? You're, you're looking it at that. Has, what is your first reaction to that? And, and, and let me show you. A, let me show you a picture. Go on, say it before I show the picture. It is more than a. Before you show me this picture, it is more than a passing resemblance to the machine. Go on. In contact. There we go. Yep. So let's go right. from there to there. Yeah. Now let me more take you there, Paul. That they made a third one on the moon. Well, so. <clears throat> I so mean, th I, this I this film it. turns out to be Contact Two. Where where's you know, your head going on that one? I, I've, I've got to say, very mixed. So on the one hand, amazing callback. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, we have this immortal line from um, H.R. Haddon, why build one? First rule of government spending, why build one when you could have two at twice the price? Because, of course, they built a second machine at the systems integration site in Hokkaido, Japan. So, so, so proof, um, proof by induction, why, yeah. why three? Why, why two? Well, you can have three. Although, bear in mind, the one in Japan and the one at the Cape were the same size. It's, it's clearly Haddon has gone bigger in his scope here by True. hollowing out the moon, <laughs> putting that material somewhere that no one noticed yeah. and building a giant yeah. machine there. Yeah. Um, also, if the aliens who built the system of wormholes in the machines built this, why would they go through all the hassle of beaming us the instructions to make our own instead of saying, go to the moon and dig here, we've built one for you, but that's a different question. Um, I gotta say though, if this is contact two, hell of a flex, but it sort of shits on the first one because this <laughs> movie is no contact. So that's true. mixed feelings. All, all, all sequels tend to do that nowadays though. So uh... <laughs> to be fair, it would, that would, yeah, actually exactly like um, Independence, Insur Independence. Whatever, Independence Day Insurrection. So yeah. It was maybe. one of those films where I was just like, this this should never have been made. Yeah. Why? Why? Do you, you think like this? how many people who said yes to this along the way were like, no, we should probably say no. <laughs> Quite a lot, I imagine. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Right. So let's so let's wrap this up. So it looks like there's a hell of a lot going on in this, right? So, and, and Emmerich said this. He said the moon coming closer, it being a disaster movie, just wasn't enough for him. It had to have something else. The government have been withholding information. Oh also, the moon is hollow. Also, it's a piece of technology that's monitoring, monitoring our evolution development. So it, it really does seem like it ticks all those boxes of being but imagine, awful slash amazing at the same time. Imagine thinking the moon coming close to Earth isn't enough. I, I, did, th I did think that sounds like quite a big deal. 
Roland. Like, yeah, on its own. And yet now we're going to have four other things. Okay. And he's like, no, 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 no. I need this and this <laughs> and this and this. This is, this is, I, I don't know how you feel about this just as we sort of wrap up, but this is what sort of annoys me about, and I'm, I'm, I'm sounding like an old git now, like modern films. There always seems to be like something has to be happening in yes. every scene. There's no scene where yes. you can just like, relax and yeah. the characters are and talking and you're actually sort of learning to like them and it's got nothing really to do with the the script you know going what? forward uh, and it, it just Halloween. it really wears me out when something has to be driving the script forward in every scene it's just sort of yeah. so quick and so much is changing at once that you just you're like it's just really don't care anymore yeah. I watched for the first time, I watched The Exorcist over Halloween. <laughs> uh, and I see why people say it's one of the best movies ever made. It's such a good movie. And part of the reason is it's very slow. Yeah. But not boring. It just builds up slowly. Yeah. Uh, and then it's got the terrific climax. Um, yeah, I kind of miss the days when movies gave you time to breathe and think. But I suppose this is like, so sharks don't have swim bladders. Sharks a few exceptions, have to keep swimming or they'll sink and they'll die. Uh, this movie has, I'm guessing, has to keep going yeah. because if it stops for more than 30 seconds, you'd be like, what the f*** <laughs> am I watching? And if it I gives think, you time to think about what's going on, then, you then be you'll be like, leave. hang on a minute. No, no, next that thing. Be, yeah. That might be why they do it. I think that's probably a good idea. That's probably a good place to finish. Paul, where can, uh, where can people keep up with what you're doing? You're always posting fascinating stuff about about the planets and our solar system follow, and wider. Follow me on Twitter at the planetary guy. Yeah. One word. Excellent. Um, and uh, and they'll see me. Yeah, sharing facts and figures about the solar system and beyond, and also why Mars is completely overrated. <laughs> exactly, and why Venus is so <laughs> awesome. I will oh make God. sure all those links are down in the description. Paul, thank you so much for taking the time again today. I really enjoyed it. I I don't know. Uh, Usually these things come in threes, right? This film comes out in there, there, there must be a third one. February, right? so, we, so, we can, so we can we can we can look to do a third one. Yeah. I don't know <laughs> where they're gonna go from there. I don't know what's left. Yeah, like they feel the bar is pretty high or low, depending on your perspective. Just, but yeah. Honestly, I can't see where they can go from here, but I'm sure I'm sure they will go somewhere of interest. And Paul, we, we will reconstruct it yes. when they do. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely be across it when they do. Paul, thank you so much again for taking the time. I know you've... My pleasure, uh, Sam. Thank you. Always a pleasure, buddy. And uh, let's talk again soon. Sounds good. See you later, dude. Cheers. Bye now. <laughs>